A great snowball has begun. So summed up the author of the fifth and final bulletin back to the campus on the activities of a group of Grinnell College students who on Monday, November 13th, 1961, had temporarily set aside academics to travel to the nation's capital. Their purpose was to demonstrate in support of President Kennedy's stated position at that time not to engage in further nuclear testing in the atmosphere. In effect, they were protesting the arms race and affirming peace. For three days, they picketed and they fasted, taking only water. And meanwhile, back on campus, many students as well as faculty members expressed their support through a shorter fast of their own. News media picked up the event and it became a rather big deal, leading three months later to a massive march on Washington to protest nuclear testing in the atmosphere. Subsequently, a New York Times story stated unequivocally the march had its, had its origins at Grinnell. This morning, as the final part of the 2014 Alumni College Curriculum on Revolution, we will hear from four alumni who took part in that trip nearly 53 years ago and in a moment I will ask them to introduce themselves. In the audience today are also some other members of the Grinnell 14 and the panelists have asked me to ask them to please stand up and Paige will come around with the microphone and uh, please stand and introduce yourselves. Uh, is Lorna Calkins here? Oh, that's too bad. I was told she might come. Lorna is uh, the recently retired head librarian of our public library in Grinnell and also the wife of Professor Emeritus of Anthropology, Doug Calkins. And she was a member of the group from Carleton College that came shortly after the Grinnellians to Washington. Several other colleges also sent delegations after the Grinnell Group, Bluffton, Oberlin, Antioch, and Cornell Colleges, Syracuse University, Cornell University, University of Chicago, among others, all part of the great snowball. Would our panelists please briefly introduce themselves, including where you live now and occupations you've had? Or Peter, go ahead. You okay. can start. We were worried when this event was set at 8 o'clock or 8.30 that no one would come. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> but we showed up. <clears throat> uh, my name's Peter Coyote. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to be sitting here because in terms of the trip, I feel like my biggest contribution was being the mechanic. <laughs> One of the two mechanics of the two old cars. But... Um, something I'm really proud of, and I would like to say for the record, it should actually have been called the Grinnell 16, because Ken Schiff and Phil Brown were left back here on campus doing a yeoman's work, orchestrating calls from other colleges that wanted to join us and realizing that they could be a clearinghouse, and there probably wouldn't have been this 25,000 march later if they had not created this clearinghouse. So I live in Mill Valley, Northern California, and uh, I make my living as an actor. I, I describe myself as a writer who makes his living as an actor. And uh, I'm a dad, I have two kids and one grandchild, and um, my best day is today. So I'm happy to be here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. 
I'm Sally. My name was Sally Singer back in the day. Um, it's changed a couple more times to Sally Singer Horwat Brodsky. And um, I am a clinical psychologist, doctoral level, with a postdoctoral Master's of Science in Psychopharmacology. Um, I have had a private practice. Uh, I've been the psych admitting psychologist in the largest mental hospital at the time in the country, St. Elizabeth's in Washington, D.C. So I've had the honor of working with s s some very sick people and watching them improve. Um, uh, Michael and I have two daughters and four grandchildren, and I live in Reston. And uh, I think that's, right now I'm retired, but I do a uh, a lot of other unremunerated work, <laughs> including this is my last year on the governing body of the American Psychological Association. Is that why they put you next to me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they said. Good morning. I'm Michael Horwant. Um, um, we were once related. Um, <laughs> we're still close, but not intimate. <laughs> Can't have yeah, everything. Can anywhere. That's right. We understand the problem. Um, um, it was um, it was beyond our wildest dreams that we would uh, end up the way that we did uh, on this trip. I'm I also live in Ruston. I am a practicing attorney, and. Um, um, June 6th will be 48 years, and um, I, I'm still going. I wouldn't say strong. <laughs> so. uh, my name's Terry Bisson. I'm a writer. I live in California. And um, like Peter, I was kind of not one of the organizers of the trip, but it was uh, I was a freshman, and um, here we are. Okay, thank you very much. We want this to be more a conversation than a series of presentations, but it did seem useful to those of us planning this panel to ask the panelists to somewhat set the stage, particularly for the benefit of people who were not on campus at the time uh, who are in the audience. And after I uh, pose a few questions to help them do that, we'll open it up for general questions and comments from the audience. And I'd like to ask Sally to begin by telling us something about what life at the college was life like in 1961. What was on students' minds? What were they paying attention to? What were they listening to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That hasn't changed. No. Uh, <laughs> What were typical activities apart from reading? Whatever you think you'd like to Okay. Know. Um, I, I will go back even a little further. We are not, Michael and I are not baby boomers. We are the old generation. In that time in high school, it was the Eisenhower years, characterized by a lot of conformity, doing the right thing, studying hard, getting into college. Um, Lucy and Desi slept in separate beds on television. Um, it was a very, uh, the, the country was getting back on its feet after the wars. Um, they were scared to death of communists. Oh, it was either better red than dead or better dead than red, and you took side. It, there was no middle ground. So when we got to Grinnell, actually one of the first things our class did was overthrow the student government. We know which side you were on. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we instituted instead one of the most complex systems of government, even out, out does Israel. Um, <laughs> about three quarters of the student body were officers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but we all went to college, you know, studied hard and so forth. And we paid attention in school. And then one day, a man who's not here, and by the way, I am not part of the 14. I worked hard in the background, but I did not go. My father would have come out of his tree. Um, 
you know, and, and he, that was not something, quote, I was allowed to do. But, um, and he was paying the bills. So um, Michael Montross, who's not here, came to Michael Horwath. Oh, one more thing. We would, went to see movies at the Strand, and one of the movies was on the beach. And it was about a nuclear holocaust. And when you come home from the Strand in those days, maybe it's still true, it's dark and quiet. It's Grinnell. It's lovely. But after a movie on the nuclear holocaust, it was terrifying. It was horrible. And so that was our background of abject fear of anything nuclear, almost to a an incredibly silly degree. But um, so uh, Michael Montross came to Michael Horwat and said, you know, I'm going to starve myself on the White House lawn because President Kennedy is thinking of resuming uh, testing in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, the um, Russians have done so. The, the way I heard about this is that I went to Park Street to meet Michael to go to dinner, and in the living room was all of Michael's suitcases, his books, everything. He's packing up to go to New Zealand. And he had all these white bags of laundry that I guess they delivered in those days. <laughs> and I go there, I said, what are you doing? And he's going to uh, get away because this is going to be the ruination. And I sat, did what every liberated woman does in those days. I sat down and started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I didn't say, you're leaving me. You know, I said, <laughs> I didn't say that. It didn't actually occur to me. I said, you're going without an education? <laughs> that was like sitting down on public toilet seats. <laughs> In the meantime, and this, this, I still think of this as an example of kindness. The laundry man comes in and sees Michael's books and everything packing to leave, sees me crying, and I believe he thought I was pregnant. <laughs> Because he put his arm around me, he said, don't worry, honey, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and it wasn't until much later that I laughed, and that kindness was so touching. In any case, Michael went, I sent him to go talk to Paul Smith, who was our political science professor. And um, Paul said, you can't run away. You have to stay and fight. And I believe that was the beginning of people, Michael Montross, Michael Horwat, uh, the, the, what we used to call them in my year, the beatniks if they wore beards. But now they were hippies. And they came and, and we said, we, we want to do something. And one of the things I think I had a little influence on was I said, you can't go around with beards. Okay, so the beatniks shaved off their beards. I helped some of the women, um, Greenwald. I can't remember her first name. Oh, Ruthie. Ruthie helped some of the women do the Jackie Kennedy bouffant <laughs> to make themselves look as mainstream as possible and to heighten the fact, because we were trying to convince people, not alienate them, to heighten the fact that we were supporting our president's reluctance. I don't know that he thought he was that reluctant. But we were supporting the president's reluctance to resume testing, and we were condemning the Soviet Union. And from there, I think the rest can speak about how it was organized. But to me, that was the main thing. The idea was, we're not different. We're regular Americans. The newspapers posed it that way. They even said he was a regular American. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, next. Okay, thanks. Anybody else like to keep the ball rolling? When um, I was actually, I had a very conservative reaction in comparison to Mike Montross. <laughs> I was only going to New Zealand. He was going to chain himself to the White House fence on the lawn and starve himself to death. And um, I think it was Sally that engineered our going to dinner uh, at Paul Smith's. She told them that we were going, crazy. G going off the deep end. Um, I can see that now. 
And, uh, um, and, you know, basically he said, you can run, but you can't hide. And it was the result of that just conversation that we decided we needed to do something constructive. And for about two to three weeks, we met at Park Street. Um, Peter and I were housemates. I think, Jack, you were in there. Ken Schiff was there. Bennett, I think you were in there. And um, 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 I had great support from my father. Um, I called him and told him that we were going to go march in Washington, and my father was from the south, southern Lithuania. <laughs> we lived in Virginia, and he said, you're going to miss classes? <laughs> I didn't tell him I was missing classes already. He said, who the hell do you think you are, Todd Quixote? <laughs> but we persevered, and this group, um, the campus was was fairly conservative. Um, it was fairly mainstream. And we focused on not only what we were going to say, but how we were going to say it. And the focus was on the audience. And how do we reach that audience? And I propose that we go to the um, uh, college um, um, press office and tell them that we were going. And we weren't there to ask for permission. But they could either make it easier for the college or harder for the college by paving the way by helping define us before we started. And at the time, Peter Hackus of NBC was a, a very prominent alumnus, and he helped um, open the door. Um, the Des Moines Register ran uh, a number of stories before we left. It got picked up by a lot of newspapers. We agreed that we needed to remove the obstacles that kept people's ears closed. And so that's why we um, um, dressed as we did. Um, we collaborated. Um, um, I would say that almost everything was by consensus. Um, we had people that were in favor of um, immediate surrender. Uh, we had people. I'm being facetious, and we had people. We had people that were at all points along the continuum, and we worked out a position that was very similar to the um, nuclear test ban treaty that was adopted. And President Kennedy gave a, a very uh, important speech at American University. And that's what led to the, to the um, uh, treaty banning atmospheric testing. Um, Tom Hayden, um, um, who was one of um, uh, Jane Fonda's husbands, um, gave a talk on the history of uh, the peace movement at Yale and said that our um, effort was the first um, and the beginning of the anti-nuclear uh, peace movement in the modern age, 120 schools followed us. And um, President Kennedy was on uh, a plane, um, and he had just confronted the radical right, um, not too different from the one that we have called the Tea Party, and um, um, maybe worse, but um, he, wanted, he wanted to encourage the kind of dissent that he read about in the paper, and so he told McGeorge Bundy, who was then the National Security 
advisor to invite us in to the White House. We are told that that was the first in modern times that that had happened. And um, McGeorge Bundy tried to corrupt us immediately uh, by offering us orange juice. And, and I think you, Peter, were the one that um, told him that we weren't going to do that. Well, I'll stop here. And you mentioned. That was also uh, a consensus decision. Um, so a couple of years ago, or maybe last year, Terry and I were collaborating on a piece for the alumni magazine about this. And um, when we were doing the research, I, I was not really aware of how skillful Michael actually was and how politically sophisticated. Terry and I were kind of taking care of the cars, and we were all part of these meetings in which these positions were hammered out. But actually, it was um, Michael and I think Jack that went to the Student Senate and yep. got... Bayard Catron. Oh, good. Thank you. Anyway, there was a lot of political sophistication that went into shaping the message, shaping the image of the messenger that was way ahead of the curve. It was Michael that knew who Sam Rayburn was when we got to Washington. He had died, and Washington was emptied out, and so Michael said, we need to have a press conference. And one of the two people who showed up for our press conference representing AP or UP was Helen Thomas, who turned out to be the doyen of, of news reporters, and she gave us a big story. So when we actually went into the White House, Michael was really the spokesman, and I was not kidding. I was kind of the mechanic. But for some reason, when we got in the room with McGeorge Bundy, he tapped me to make a statement. And it's true that McGeorge Bundy offered us orange juice, and we hadn't had a chance to confer. We hadn't had a chance to do anything. And I don't know, we just sat there for a minute and just sat there. And at a certain point, I just felt, I don't even know if I was the first to speak, but whoever spoke correctly assessed the group ethos. And we thought, no, thank you. We're doing this fast. And he was not a guy that was used to hearing no. <laughs> so he immediately said, well, you know, Gandhi drank fruit juice. <laughs> we answered to a higher authority. <laughs> yeah. And we just sat there again. And the feeling was no. And whether it was me or whether it was someone else. And I, I mentioned that only because it was, it was kind of astounding. It's not like in the 60s. We had a lot of interpersonal skills for communication, and we had learned about nonviolent speech and, you know, being careful with one another. And we were just a bunch of kids in the spotlight, and it was a serious spotlight. And for me, what I got out of it was I came to Washington thinking straight out of high school civics class, and I thought we had information from the hinterlands that we were going to deliver to our representatives to help them govern more wisely and more justly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what I believed. And I was in the front row, and I was about this far from McGeorge Bundy. And I looked at him, and I thought, holy shit. <laughs> this we are a problem to be solved for this man. He does not care about 14 students walking around with signs. He's solving a problem for his president and his administration. He has a course charted out. And I realized that the only way I, we, were ever going to get this guy's attention was going to come back with an army. And in my thinking, and what took my life into the counterculture was I thought that that would be the army. And so that seemed to me that growing movement of the other 23 colleges and the thousands of people who joined us, that seemed like the beginning of a mass movement that was worth putting energy and attention in to represent the feelings of all of us and damn well insist that, that we be heard. And um, 
Really, I'd rather let other people speak, but that was a seminal lesson for me. I said, I'm never walking around the street again with a sign, because I looked into his eyes, and I, my dad was a pirate. I knew just what, who he was, and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to adjust my take. But the fact that we did it so skillfully and we had such able leadership and such, even one of the articles that hit the paper inspired an executive in Des Moines, an executive of a big insurance company. He gave us a brand new car <laughs> to go to Washington. We had an old 48 Chevy and a 49 Ford that we raised the money to buy. He gave us a brand new car and three walkie-talkies. <laughs> yeah, those kind of things happened. Terry, would you like to say anything? Well, I didn't want to add much just to say that um, you talk about the snowball of all the other colleges going, but there was a, I don't know about the snowball image, but it was also in the context of a larger building opposition. Nine years later, it was Kent State. They don't invite you. They didn't get invited to the White House. And so <clears throat> things were changing at a accelerated Right. There, we were part of, we, anyway, that's what I want to say. Could I add one? Sure, go ahead. Just, just one more piece to that. Um, Peter mentioned uh, going to the student senate. Um, at the time, we were, as I said, really an essentially conservative, nice guy campus. Nobody thought that the national defense policy was the specific preserve of the Grinnell College student senate. But when Michael and Baird went before, Baird Catron, who's not here, went before that body and in just five minutes each talked about why this was important, it was like, of course, if I can get radioactive kishkas and you can get your arms blown off in a war, we have something to say. And we will say it and say it and say it until you hear it. And the student senate caught that and so passed a resolution that the whole campus was doing a three-day sympathy fast. And Saga Bob got with the program. I don't know if you know Saga Bob. Okay, so it's in the way you talk to an audience that creates the power that makes people like Mr. McGeorge Bundy have to pay attention. Could you say a little more about the attitude of the administration and the faculty to your effort? It was um, amazing that the faculty, by and large, irrespective of their political persuasion, were supportive of what we were doing because of the way we were doing it. And, you know, we could have been bounced out for missing classes. Um, we could have bounced out, been bounced out because we missed exams. And that didn't happen. Um, there were very conservative students who were supportive of what we did, not because they agreed with us, but because of the fact that we were acting responsibly. And... Um, um, I think that the composition of the people that were going were a cross-section of the campus in many ways. And those people that were going helped amalgamate a consensus. And the administration really, um, it wasn't hostile. And I think it w we would not have gotten the support we got from the, uh, uh, from the press office if it had not been okay with the administration. And I think the faculty senate was uh, very um, um, uh, supportive, but not in an official way. And I'll never forget uh, Sam Barron, who many of you probably had for yes. history. He said to me, I wish I could be young enough to be as certain as you are. Today, I understand that. 
uh, the invitation to visit the White House might have been the high watermark of your time in Washington, but what else went on? How, how would you describe the, your days there? Well, I'll start. The, one of the really major commitments that people made was not to do anything that undermined our credibility. You know, any, any departure, somebody getting... Uh, uh, Smoking getting dope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, everybody understood that there was a, a, a bigger cause and that in order to keep our credibility, we had to stick to the, to the commitment. And um, so each morning we were out picketing. Um, we went to the Soviet embassy. And um, um, I handed a petition to, um, I think he was the custodian of the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, nice we <laughs> talked was. about, uh, no uh, uh, you know, that we were protesting the Soviet Union's resumption of testing. And, of course, by doing that, I mean, we were obviously sincere about that, but it also put us on the side of being patriots. We were taking... Everything we were doing were, was supportive of our government, even as we were seeking to change it. And um, that that uh, that encounter was was um, 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 was caught in a in a photograph that went throughout the nation. And I, I think that was another factor. And then. One other thing I would mention is that uh, um, I was interviewed by Peter Hackus, and Sally, you might want to talk about that. It was really, what is it called? Monitor. It was like the NPR of today. It's, it's the, it was the news station that you listened to. Um, and I turned it on, and I heard Michael's voice, well... <laughs> And he explained just this, and I got goose pimples. It was really, it, it was really um, exciting. I don't know what else there was, but I think it just gave more uh, street cred um, to to the movement, and um, and and the whole student, the whole student movement. Let me just say just one more thing. One of the things that I think was was new, not like we in, we invented it, but if you just put yourself in the place of young people, we're off to college, most of us for the first time, and starting from an idea or a strong feeling you had, we invented this way of getting together and having discussions, and underneath it all was a kind of hopefulness a kind of feeling that we counted, we could be empowered, and that if we did it right, it, it, it would work. And that feeling actually carried all the way through the counterculture, and it's now kind of embedded in the majority culture. Not that it doesn't have a shadow side, because you can have a lot of nutbag groups getting together and having discussions and working contrary to the national good, perhaps. but. That was what was stunning to me, was the the power of translating a feeling into ideas and into group activity, and then everybody putting their small self aside and agreeing, yeah, well, I would like to call for a communist revolution, but I won't. Yeah. It's not going to serve the group, or, you know, I would like to call for something else. And the other the thing that I'm left out in my introduction is I'm a Zen Buddhist priest. And it's something that I see in intentional communities where people go into church groups or any kind of intentional group. 
it gives a frame for setting aside, putting your ego on a long leash and being able to look at things kind of objectively and cooperatively because there's something far more important. And this was my first experience of really doing that and having to grab my oversized and unruly personality and jerk its chain and say, wait a minute, there's something more important here. And I've never gotten over that. I've, I, I, that was a real high water mark of my education. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the group was in touch with uh, students at other institutions that were, you were trying to coordinate an effort. Could you say something more about that? One of the debates we had in terms of the timing of the trip was should we wait until other schools had in effect signed on so that there would be a continuous stream of, of uh, uh, other schools that were coming? And it was clear that the logistics and the stage of deliberations in these other schools was much too tentative. And we decided we were going. And if others came, fine. If they didn't, fine. But we were going. And Terry. Oh, sure, Terry. I'm sorry. I mean, people are talking a lot about how we made a conscious decision to be responsible rather than irresponsible. I can't imagine what irresponsible would have been. I can't imagine what choices we had that we rejected. Um, and also, um, fasting is radical. It's not a petition. You know, going a thousand miles is radical. Not going to class is radical. And when we went to the Soviet embassy, to me that wasn't patriotic. That was being internationalist. It was saying that the U.S. and the Soviet Union were equally. Um, so I, I think um, I don't think it was. Well, that's that's what I have to say. I, I, I would I would like to add to that a little and and maybe challenge it a bit. There are two examples that I can think of that are different. One is the Occupy Wall Street movement, which as much as I sympathized with individuals, it just annoyed the hell out of me. Um, and then there was in Israel uh, in 2011, another movement, and it was very effective. It, it unite, I mean, Israel government, nobody can agree with anybody about anything, and it's, it's, it's a mess. But there was a man that is credited, his name was Itzik Shmuley, and he was in the United States at the time that he found out that a woman named Daphna Leek was pitching a tent on Rothschild Avenue, and she wanted to um, make um, the rents. She was protesting the increase in rents, and she said, we want to live in Israel. And Yitzhak Shmuley came back to Israel and he became the responsible adult of that movement. And he had leadership skills and he had communication skills. And um, he, because of the way that he helped frame the, uh, her frame that, I, I, I've got the number here because I find it hard to believe, 300,000 Israelis picketed for a change in the rents. You don't get that kind of consensus you know, in the street. It was effective. The Occupy Wall Street was not effective. And again, there was a leader who didn't present himself as the one right way. He presented, he, he touched all the, the Hasidim, he touched all the different subgroups and brought them in. It's what now um, Ralph Nader and Grover Norquist are starting to do with each other. They're talking about the ways in which they agree. Um, up until now, um, the Democrats are presenting themselves as the moral group and the others are the selfish group. But there are ways that you can cast economic solutions in a very practical, enlightened, self-interest way. And that, hopefully, is starting to happen in this country. So yes, they took radical action, but they did it the Grinnell 14, but they did it responsibly, 
and with an eye to reaching people and not just, as, as uh, Peter said, not just demonstrating ego. You know, I, I think, uh, Terry, that your, your points are, are well taken in that this was unusual for the time. Um, and I also agree with you that it was not just a, a political gesture to go to the right. Soviet Union, but I think that, again, consciousness about getting your message heard is is the challenge of our time. I mean, if, if you look at, at income equality, if you look at, at, at climate change, um, the problem is not in, in, in a repertoire of solutions. The problem is in getting a political consensus to implement them. And we are at a point where there is such a cleavage in thinking that people, people have a sense of reality that is totally at war with, the, with others that disagree with them. And um, I think Ralph Nader and uh, Norquist started out, they finally agreed about what time it was. And, <laughs> And then they moved on. But that's important. Anything like that is important. And when, when you're angry and you're feeling self-righteous and you're feeling, how could they be so stupid? You are sure to do nothing. And the challenge of our time is not technological and scientific. It's how do we get to talk to each other and understand each other and find a way that we can work together. It's very easy to be against coal, as long as you're not a coal miner, as long as you aren't an owner of a coal mine, as long as you don't depend for your livelihood on that. And finding creative ways to take a policy that falls unevenly on people, some people gain from a policy, some lose from a policy, and some aren't affected from a policy. And today that's as sharp as it's ever been in the, in the climate change area. And finding a way to do that, I think the lessons of, of Grinnell 14 for the, for, for the people that are in school now and for us in our lives today uh, is, is really applicable to any kind of change that's going to occur because as Peter said, and incidentally I recommend Peter's book, it's, it's about the counterculture. It's called uh, Sleeping Where I Lie. Where I Fall. And I'm, where I Fall. Where I Fall. It's close. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so picky. picky, picky. <laughs> Although it would have been redundant now that I think of it. <laughs> and, um, but, but it's about the counterculture and the problems of, 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 of trying to change things. Um, and I think that, that is where all of us you know, can, can gain. And I think Terry discredits himself because it took a lot of, a lot of willingness not to be authentic in, in the way that some people felt in being what they would not normally be for a larger cause. You know, um, it's interesting that you, you were talking about dealing with people that are going to be the losers in policy. When Terry and I were talking the other day, I've been working on a TED speech about this. And um, they've asked me to speak sometime here this weekend, and that's what I want to talk about is... And the, the Grinnell 14 is a perfect kind of paradigm. Um, I've been trying to kind of find the political practicality in Buddhist practice. Because if you can't put the practice to work, if it's not efficacious on the thorniest problems, maybe it just should be a hobby. And so one of the things that you, you get out of the, the Buddhist understanding that the entire universe is one interdependent system. That's one half of the equation. 
And the other half of the equation is every person, every grain of sand, every blade of grass is unique. And the problem is language only lets us talk about one half or the other half at the same time, and we tend to forget about it. So once you kind of remember that it's all connected, if a country changes its policies, the first thing you have to do is take care of the people that are going to be the losers. Because the people that have been harvesting timber or grazing cattle on public land or mining oil or pursuing wealth in certain kind of ways that were legal but are now considered against the, the, the public interest, they shouldn't be held responsible for that change. And they need to be protected. And if they're not, there will never be a political way out of the solution. And what we see today is a country that's kind of divided by no one wanting to have their ox gored and the people who are on the side of what they consider self-righteousness are not taking care of their opponents as if they were part of the same system. And when I look back at the Grinnell 14, somehow, even as very young people, we managed to do that. We don't know how we did it. It just maybe mutual affection or maybe, you know, a commonality of point of view. But um, it stayed important to me. And the older I've gotten, the more important it's become. And so I think that's what I'm going to try to talk about. Learn to play well with others. Learn to play well. I'm sure we'll have opportunity to come back to the broader implications. I'd like to ask one final detail question, and that is what it was like to come back to campus, how you were received by the college, and what was going through your own minds at that time. You know, it was, um, it was the lesson that I did not want to learn. Um, it was crushing, and I was uh, depressed for a while about it. As long as we were all wearing the same hat, as, all, as long as we were all sharing the same goal, and I don't mean just the 14, I mean the campus. The campus. There was a cohesion and a, uh, a feeling of goodwill. My hope was that we would create a peace institute at Grinnell, that we would institutionalize this, and that we would be looking at conflict resolution and, and the like. And everybody went back to business as usual. There was no rejection or repudiation. I mean, people were very complimentary and all of that. But being able to sustain change is just extraordinarily hard. It's a marathon. It, it's, it's, that's what Yitzhak Shmuley said when the, when the rents were lowered and the people went away. There's still more work to do, but this is a marathon. It's something you have to keep doing all your life, and that's hard. I was a victim of our success. We came back, and um, suddenly the um, in loco parentis rules of Grinnell seemed folly. I mean, we couldn't have a girl in the room. We couldn't have a beer. I had... I, I had moved off campus at in sophomore year. I was just intolerable. And so Michael and I were talking and I had such respect for Michael's political acumen. And there was a campaign going along for uh, Council of House Presidents and none of the issues were being addressed. And <laughs> Michael convinced me that we could run a dark horse candidate <laughs> with no intention to win. But we were going to raise the issues and force the other candidates to challenge the college about enforcing state law and enforcing sexual morality. And God, 10 minutes of listening to him, I stepped up. <laughs> and uh, the only part where he was wrong, we, we succeeded entirely by following his advice. 
The only thing that he left out was we won. <laughs> and by winning, I had to give up my apartment and, <laughs> and move back on campus. Terry, anything you'd like to add about coming back to campus? No, I just, uh, not really. Okay, that's fine. At this point, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Paige, are you there with a microphone or, okay, somebody's there with a the microphone. So if you'd uh, like to make a comment or ask a question, we will get the microphone to you and everybody can hear. Thank you. Uh, it w obviously, it was very impressive uh, what you did uh, as such a small group. But my question is, and, and to be very frank with you, I don't remember that part of my uh, years on campus. I don't know what I was doing, but it was obviously a very Probably significant thing that was taking place. <laughs> so my, my, uh, my, my question is, why were you only 14? Why were you not 140? How, what kind of effort did you make to get other people on campus involved? Well, you don't want to drive 140 people to D.C. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, I, I really think we're forgetting that this was not a petition drive. It was not a vote. It was a radical action. It was not a polite action. It and scary. it was a little bit scary. And um, and I think it was it was fine that it was a small it was never intended to be a whole whole bunch of people. It's not a mass action. It was a little. Uh, it was a, a leverage action, and um, and so uh, I don't think there was ever an intention to get um, uh, to organize a bunch of people. Well, that we sat and we took name. We sat and we took names to get people to support us, and I don't know where that list went. But a lot of people signed the petition, and and the and the student government supported us. But everyone wasn't packing off to go to Washington. Well, tell some what some of the people said to you when you uh, people said, "Who are you to represent our school?" Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I represent our school. Yeah, that's what I just <laughs> just just did. I think I can say it loud enough. How did it end in Washington? At his mother's house. <laughs> I th Ken, do you remember how you w worked the brokering system? I think they came after we left. <laughs> I don't even remember how this sentence began. <laughs> I like you. He doesn't remember how this sentence began. What are you asking? Him? Well, Ken doesn't remember, but he and Phil Brown did a great job, and they created a kind of calendar. And Larry Smucker started it. I think he had a relative or a friend at Beloit, and this was before social networking and Facebook. We just started calling friends, and friends started calling friends. And the two people who stayed at Grinnell served as the nucleus of this hub, and they kind of arranged for people to follow us, and there they did. There was a bulletin. I didn't even know about that until uh, Paige... Uh, uh, sent a, a, a student unearthed a bulletin that there were six of them um, that gave progress reports about what was happening. I think Larry wrote those. Larry wrote them. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know how they got. I don't either. I don't either. I never saw yeah, them. I, I, I didn't week. either until the. But <laughs> it, it, they made it up. Right. In, in answer to your question. As you might imagine, the thing that was most on our mind as, as this ended Dinner. was eating. <laughs> <laughs> Even before any other drives. <laughs> and um, um, we went to my mother's house, and she made the best hamburgers. I, 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 I can still remember that, and I can't. Re I'm like Ken. I look in the mirror. And I'm trying to remember who the hell I'm looking at, but I remember the hamburgers. Well, and, when we uh, were fasting, there's some debate as to who they were, but 
Jack, you thought they were young Republicans and somebody else thought they were the John Birch Society. There was a crew of kind of right-wing people right. who were gorging on fried chicken <laughs> while we were circulating in front of the White House, just stuffing their faces with They've fried all chicken. They've died of heart attacks since then. <laughs> Terry said that there was a school, and I, I, I vaguely remember that now, that yes. just as we were leaving, we stayed at a Quaker house. And uh, aptly named as Gaunt House. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten that. And um, the deputy um, national security advisor was Mark Raskin, who became a major progressive uh, force in the country. Went to and jail, actually. Did he? Yeah, he went to jail for draft resistance, but he was, he was McGeorge Bundy's top assistant. Yeah, which goes to show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and he came, and he's the one that, he was really excited because he was one of the major advocates within the administration for uh, banning nuclear testing, and he's the one that, told us about what happened on the plane and, and, uh, and told us about being invited into the White House. And, um, but that was at this Quaker house. And as we were leaving um, to go back to Grinnell and to, to eat, um, <laughs> a, school, a school did come in. I, I can't remember which one. I thought it was Erlum, but may, I, you know, I it could be. Confused. The reports that were coming in mentioned Bluffton as one of the very early following schools. Sorry, Bluffton, Bluffton College. Bluffton. Other questions Bluffton. out there? Oh, Bluffton. Okay. Buddy, and there's someone here too. <clears throat> Let me just stand up because my knee is better if I stand up. <laughs> Um, so I'm Ann Brenneman Anderson, and I spent 22 years in um, psychologist for social responsibilities coordinator role, and I've been in Washington, D.C. since 1964. So um, I want to underscore the exquisite political acumen that you guys displayed. I can't, I, I've lost track of how many times I have stood in front of the White House or marched on the, the mall <coughs> about anything, I mean, you name it, I've, I've marched. Um, and the critical piece here is about thinking about your audience. And I think you all did a fabulous job. And the, the point of supporting the White House in trying to do something that you wanted them to do uh, is, a, is like they, the, that was where you cut through the mess and were able to make that happen. So thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I think we all noticed at the beginning was this sense of, you know, we need to do something. There's some pressure. We don't quite know what to do. We haven't planned things. There's a great deal of passion. And I'm curious if in your discussions as you looked to the move toward uh, going to uh, Washington and do this protest, you look back at other historical events or individuals in various protest movements. I mean, there have been labor movements in the early 20th century. Um, there's the labor organizer, Saul Alinsky, who talked and evolved a lot about that. There were civil rights protests. Um, was this consciously on your mind uh, or any of these discussions or essentially was this a really fortuitous, well, I don't know, fortuitous is probably not the right word, but it set your sense of things came together correctly without this careful, well, say, without this look at history or or, or reaching back in any of these areas? That might have been a very good thing to do, but we didn't think of it. Um, um, what, what we did do is we did a tremendous amount of reading on the trip, forming our statement, and, and we got it down to one page, and there were a lot of people that contributed to that. 
Um, and um, we had a tape recorder in the car that Peter was talking about from this insurance company executive, and we played tapes of, of, of speeches that were going. I think, Jack, you had a lot to do with that. Um, uh, I just remember his name, William Feynman. Yes. That's my job. <laughs> Somebody had to. You're not dementing yet. Um, but but um, in, in any event, listening to different positions and reading different positions and talking about those, we did a great deal of that. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, I'm Jack Spence, class of 64. I would, uh, Terry uh, mentioned Kent State, and I would be curious to know, we've sort of jumped from then to now, I would be curious to know for the four of you and also for Professor Andelson, where you were in your thinking about the event of, that we're now describing when Kent State came along. It struck me that your, your comments are sort of on the one hand we were we were trying to express what we had in common with the president's policy. And on the other hand, there were certain moments, what I would call Peter's McGeorge Bundy moment, where the answer is no. Uh, so I'd be curious to know what you were thinking about that trip to Washington around the time that Kent State happened. And the reason I'm asking you is because I think, if I'm not mistaken, you were a student here at that point. And if you could say something about what the campus was like at that point, where I think it was probably fairly easy to get 100 people to go to Washington. Um, um, and I also know you're a student of intentional community, so you might comment on that. Jack, what year was Kent State? 70, 70. 1970. Oh, OK, so I know exactly what I was. <clears throat> I was heading babies. Yeah. So um, by 19, I, I also want to say, that the same month as Kent State, there were either 21 or 24 black students murdered at a college in the South at the same time. That doesn't get a lot of, a lot of play. What? Yeah, Jackson State. Thanks very much. Anyway, so by 1970, I had been through the peak of the Haight-Ashbury, and we were living in intentional communities and working out alternate economies. And the thinking was a little naive and in retrospect a mistake that a, the idea of a counterculture kind of condemns you to marginality because it moves you out of the mainstream and you, you develop your own style which is in very uh, many cases at cross currents with other people. There were a lot of people who thought politically and economically like I did but they didn't want, you know, their kids around our feral children and <laughs> our sexual practices and drug use. But I was not surprised, you know, in the same way that I look at the fracking controversy today and I think, wow, well, America is finally being treated the way we've treated the third world all these years. So when the guns were turned on our own students, I thought, yeah, it's, it's, it's really coming home. And from that, I think there was a big shift that a lot of students realized you couldn't go against uh, the American political and military power with force. And I think that's what gave the early initial impetus to the environmental movement. And um, in my case, cultural movements, that people, people were looking at the problem from other ways you know, maybe the weathermen were a little more old-fashioned, confrontational. We're going to blow up buildings to take a moral positions, with which I'm in agreement. I wasn't in agreement with their strategy because I didn't think you could confront this machine with violence. But I remember Kent State as a pivotal, pivotal moment, and from there the environmental movement kind of kind of multiplied logarithmically and I think it had something to do with that revelation that um, we're warning you we're apt to shoot you if you push this thing too far 
if you get in the way of McGeorge Bundy's plans or whoever the, the figure in power was, then we might just shoot you. It seems to me, and the historians in the crowd can correct me, but when I think back on all revolutions that I studied, which was the French and the American, it was actually the middle class that advocated for revolution. It wasn't the poor who were just struggling to eat. And I have the feeling that the way things that are going economically in this country, with people having a harder, harder time just making a living, people with with advanced degrees, people who are, you know, the, the, they call them the working poor, that we're headed towards something big now. And my hope is that we can, that we can do it. And there are so many different things that need to be done. You know, if you read uh, Piketty's book, if you read uh, Michael Lewis's book about the stock market, if you read, um, you know, with, with fracking and, and what we need to do for the environment, all of these things. My hope is that each of these movements develops their own responsible adult who knows how to organize, who knows how to work, who c can create a simple message that draws people in and doesn't just get themselves killed, you know, but actually works to effect change. Because otherwise, it's just not going to happen. And it has to happen with taking into account that we, our own enlightened self-interest is to keep everybody in, in the circle. Um, and, and to, uh, that's all. Are we respond to a question or? Jack. Well, let me say, uh, you know, we all have our different views of this and, and why we took part. I took part not because it was responsible, but because it was radical. To me, fasting and going to Washington was a radical thing. And I didn't, we, we talk about um, Tom Hayden sort of, you know, sanctified us as the beginning of the student movement. He wasn't just Jane Fonda's husband, he was the founder of SDS. And I thought that the idea of supporting the government to me was a tactical question. And, and at times it's a good thing. But I also support it when people started burning draft cards. I supported yeah. it when they started carrying Viet Cong flags. I supported. So, so to me, what was neat about the Grinnell 14 and, and everything we did uh, was not that it was different than what came later but that it was, it, to me, it's of a piece with a growing radicalism, and there's a time to bring people together, and there's a time to split them apart. And I didn't see those as coming uh, as different things. That, to me, um, so that's how I saw the Washington trip. Uh, I, I think that's a very important point. Uh, there isn't a, a one... Um, a, 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 a one size fits all. one size fits all, and and I think that's very right. Um, and you just hope you get the right size at the right time. Uh, and and um, um, I I think that that it it really is a critical point that we could have overlooked. Um, but what I wanted to say was, Peter, when you talked about the fact that you looked into the eyes of George Bundy and saw that he had an agenda and that we weren't on it, <laughs> and that we had to try to persuade him that as much as he might not have wanted to, um, talking about a personality conflict, <laughs> I did not like that guy one bit, <laughs> but you know he. Thank you. Um, in a refined way, you shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but he was a twenty-four carat rectal part. <laughs> but but the change that's going to come is going to have to come from the grassroots. It, it, it it's not going to come from the top. There are people on the top that want the change, but it's going to have to come from us. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I certainly would never... Uh, well, actually, why don't you give Jack the microphone? He's been trying to, to speak. Yeah. 
no, I, I, one thing I'd like to correct on the historical record, when Michael Harwat talks about consensus, that's his description of an edict. Because when Michael Harwat said, Michael Harwat said, haircuts, coats, and ties, period. There was no discussion, there was no dissent, and that's what we did. In his mind, that was consensus. <laughs> The second thing I wanted to say was the term Grinnell 14 has always made me uncomfortable. I mean, it was a phenomenon. There happened to be 14 of us who went to Washington that created a, something that happened on this campus on, on other campuses that carried forward. But, you know, I, when did that term begin in use? Because at the time we were not the Grinnell 14. For most of the last 50 years, we have not been the, the Grinnell 14. Somebody along the way decided, more recently, that it was the convenient way to describe right. what it was. We because when you title. say Grinnell 14, you know what it was. But, but to call it the March on Washington, the Fast in Washington, the nuclear cons movement in Washington, there's no other easy way to say That's it. Right. But to call it the Grinnell 14, I mean, it puts it on a level that I think we don't deserve. The other thing I do want to emphasize, though, it was Michael Horwat who saw this unique combination of behaving and making a statement that would have an impact. I mean, that made it, did, did make it truly different from all the others that had their own right and own role. But I take absolutely no credit for it. I went along and I did my job. I remember William Plymouth's name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say a little bit about the, that background, because you're right. Michael comes from a background where his father was a victim of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. And his father um, was a union organizer. And his mother became so active in the Democratic Party that when she died, she had in her purse checks that she'd gotten like two, you know, a week before from people for contributions for the Democrats. I mean, if, if uh, the Messiah comes and was a Republican. <laughs> anyway, so he came from a background where they had to deal with the government. You know, I have an iron trap memory, Jack. <laughs> and you are wrong. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> one of the interesting things about this process is that I began getting emails from Peter saying, do you remember? And there were responses from all of us. He was kind of choreographing the massing of this story that he was going to do something with who knows what. Knows what. And it was, it was very for a much, book. It, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and, but I didn't get that in the beginning. I just got the fact that this was like the blind man and the elephant because every single person would come up with a different aspect of this event. And I think the results for each of us were slightly different. When I, I, I follow Peter right exactly up to the McGeorge Bundy look and he was a horrifying creature. He was an aged wasp who'd controlled everything all his life. And I looked at that, and what you know, this this you know I came to college sort of to get educated as a side event, and <laughs> this was the major educational moment of my entire period of Grinnell. I looked at him and I said, "This is not going to work. <laughs> this political thing is great. They can have a lovely time doing it." Peter went looking for an army, I went looking for a studio. You know, how are you going to change the world? And my conclusion was, you're not going to change it by mass numbers, you're going to change it one beautiful object at a time. And so, for me, of course I had to leave Grinnell to do that, because as a rule, the better the college, the worse the art department. And in Grinnell's case, that was entirely the fact. And so, I... Um, lasted until the end of the next semester and decamped. But um, it was, it, for me, it was educationally unparalleled. 
I wanted to say one thing about McGeorge Bundy, not about him personally, but the way we're talking about it. Yeah. And let's just be real about it. We're all human beings, right. and we all come on this earth with the same capacity for anger and delusion and greed and, you know, hatred. And one of the big problems in all political events is that we divide ourselves up. So it was a hell's angel who once said to me, for every finger you point at me, there's three pointing back at you. We would be just like McGeorge Bundy if we were charged with those responsibilities, if we accepted those premises, if we put ourselves in service of a, of a state that was based on profit and private property. We would be the asshole. So I think one of the things that we have to do is to separate the person from the behavior. And that when you're having a conflict with someone, to realize that the person you're arguing with is you. That's right. That you have strict positions, you have prejudices, you have the same capabilities and capacities for delusion that he has. And if you accept that, it actually subtly but practically changes the way you talk to that person. You don't talk to them as separate. You don't talk to them as an outsider. You don't talk to them as a judge. And from the intimacy that ensues from that, sometimes things actually change. People will relax and start to listen. It doesn't work in a situation where people are shooting at you. But when you're talking, and so I think it's a useful practice not to separate ourselves from McGeorge Bundy. I'm the same animal he is. I've dedicated myself to different premises and principles, but had I followed his path, I'd probably be just as bad. I think that's a great point. I do too. Consensus. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, perhaps. I'd like to uh, go back to what Michael said about <clears throat> wishing to come back to Grinnell and start something uh, that would feature uh, nonviolent conflict resolution and, and uh, teach people that. And I'm just wondering if you know about the Iowa Peace Institute that was founded, and I can't give you the date that it was founded, but it was founded by Republicans and Democrats in the state Senate and House of Representatives and our governor. And eventually, George Drake was the president, and I was the vice president of our board. And eventually, the Iowa Peace Institute had been able to teach nonviolent non conflict resolution to teachers and anyone in the, in the uh, state who wanted to learn those skills. And um, <clears throat> I fortunately grew up with them because my mother taught them to me. So it was just a natural for me. But, you know, it's like you said, not, it isn't for everyone. Many ha have to learn it from scratch. And um, eventually, the college, Grinnell College, um, we, we were originally located just kitty corner from uh, the North Campus, the edge of the North Campus. And um, eventually, the college took over the Iowa Peace Institute, sort of absorbed it into our curriculum. And if you talk to George Drake, he can be more specific about uh, exactly how, how it works. Thank you. Thank you. I can add just a little bit of information to the last comment. The Peace Institute was renamed after a couple of years at the college, and it uh, now exists as the Peace and Conflict Resolution Good. Studies yes. Program. Just so what you we're, we're on it. It took us 52 years yeah. to get it. <laughs> and it's a marathon. <laughs> it is a marathon, indeed. Uh, I guess I'd like to close with one last question for the panel. Uh, you were all 20-something at the time, and of course the college is still full of people who are 20-something, and there's still a lot to do, still a lot that needs doing. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to respond to your question. You kindly included me in it. Just a, a few days ago, I gave a baccalaureate talk here 
on the 1970 situation and the fact that the college did not have a commencement my senior year. Um, and it was a moment of coming together. That was a time that the entire campus was quite uh, united in its anguish and pain over Kent have State. A no. because of Kent State. Kent State and Jackson State and the college was really falling apart uh, at that point. There's a lot to say about it. I'm not going to use this uh, right. opportunity <laughs> much as I'd like to. Um, <laughs> But the, the, the point is there's still an awful lot to be done. There's still racism, there's still sexism, there's still wars that are unreasonable. Uh, the environmental situation is desperate. And I'm wondering what, uh, if, if any of you see things, particular issues today that resonate with the nuclear testing at your time that could become a focus for action by the 20-somethings now at the college. Yeah, I do. Please. So just go down the... So um, I look at things in a kind of uh, triage situation. There's so much to be done that you can just spread yourself so thin that you'll, you'll do nothing. So I try to look at, for me, the set of all sets is the environment. Business fits within the environment. Profit fits in, within the environment. If you, the idea of successful business in a degraded environment is just not looking closely. So my, the first level of everything I look at are environmental threats. And primary among them is nuclear issue uh, whether it's nuclear weapons or nuclear power and um, climate change. But under that, what makes it complex and what makes it difficult to, to deal with is under that are very human impulses, attachments to comfort. So we can call that greed. Greed for comfort. Greed for a kind of culture which is completely unsustainable. I went, was asked to speak at a conference called the R-Day Conference in Aspen, A-R-E something, American Renewable Energy Institute. And I came and there were 15 private jets on the runway. <laughs> and uh, all of these guys were talking and I was one of the last speakers. And I had to say, you know, I'm hearing a lot of how uh, at this conference. I'm hearing a lot of how we're going to make wind power and how we're going to make... Uh, solar power and how we're going to do this and that. I'm not hearing a lot of why. And if the purpose of all this is to keep this totally indulgent, unsu unsustainable culture afloat, we're driving up the off-ramp on the freeway. And the next heroes are going to be the people that can teach us to live on 30 to 40 percent less energy without going into squalor. So the reason I'm kind of glad that the um, counterculture has evaporated and we're all in this together is that each of us has a chance to press for change wherever we are. I mean, I don't think that just changing your light bulbs for LEDs is going to do it, but it's something you can do. Not bringing stuff home in plastic bags is something you can do. Yeah, I drive a, a Volt. Uh, so. I mean, I think it's, it's, the problem is so vast that if we don't do it, I'm shocked that we're still advertising 400 horsepower cars. I'm shocked that there's still an industry that's casting doubt on the science of global warming. I don't know any of these guys that would cast doubt on the science of gravity and leap off the top of a 10-story building. <laughs> So I have to assume there are short-term financial implications that they're sacrificing their grandchildren to. So that to me is the issue. Nuclear testing was the same issue. It was the first kind of global biocidal threat and I feel that I've just stayed in that track and I'm not quitting. My concern along with that um, is uh, with medical care, affordable Medicare for everybody, 
and where you don't have to um, wait until you can fit into some some network to get care that you need. And I can be specific about members of my family. Um, so I, I, somehow we have to join countries like Finland and like um, other European countries that know how to provide Medicare to people. Our children also are the first generation who are not going to live as long as we live. I think that the um, climate change report that just came out um, hit me between the eyes. Uh, I, I, uh, there hasn't been anything that I haven't, you know, read the whole report. I've read parts of summaries. I am going to read the whole report. But to me, that changed everything. Um, I have uh, four grandchildren, and. Uh, two daughters we have. And to me, uh, this is life and death. This is the counterpart of testing in the atmosphere. And I think th that w we need to try to get a, a carbon tax where the proceeds are used to help the people that are going to be hurt and let the market take care of of uh, alternative sources of energy because unless we help the people that are going to be hurt we're not going to get the change well I'm sort of hopeful in the long run the big issue for me is uh, the prisons in which in this country are so stuffed and um, you know but I don't see a, a student or otherwise movement dealing with that but I don't know what to do. I'm an old man now. So, Well, Grinnell, as you may know, also has a prison right. program. And uh, students, many students are involved in going to the prisons and teaching classes. And it is now possible for inmates who are about to be released to get credit toward, toward, their, toward their college degree. One last thing. Here's a kind of capsule of the problem. I'm so grateful to hear uh, Michael speak about taking care of the people that are going to be hurt because it's the critical piece that's left out of all political dialogue. But just think about this for a second a as a problem. The NASA scientists estimate there are about 2,700 gigatons of oil under the Earth's surface. And that oil is the basis of the valuation of the wealth of the oil companies and the stockholders and the investors. It's an, in, it's an inconceivable amount of wealth. The same scientists estimate that if we burn 500 of those gigatons, there will not be human life on the earth. So we have a culture that has incalculable wealth that's dedicated to suicide that's dedicated to using commodities which will end life on Earth. So when you consider it from Michael's point of view, it's a gigantic problem. How are we going to create economic vehicles and social vehicles that are going to account for the countless people that are going to have to reduce their wealth on paper? So, and a case in point is, uh, I was one of the people that was involved in this uh, Chevron suit. I was one of the people suing Chevron, and we won a $28 billion judgment against Chevron for polluting an area in the Amazon the size of Rhode Island and creating epidemics of previously unheard cancers among the Indian tribes there, 143 Indian tribes, poisoning the water, driving off the game, giving their kids uh, cancers that are inconceivable. What are you going to do? Chevron's just said, we're not paying. And they have the wealth and the political power because they're not going to lose. 
So this is exactly the kind of problem that better minds than my own are going to have to think about. I'm not an economist, but somebody is going to have to figure out ways of creating environmental bonds or funds, whereas these people can be made, if not whole, can be given enough that they will willingly not use their wealth to create political impediments to this. And I just think it's useful to see the problem in that stark and large a context because that's what it that's what it really is. We're very grateful to the panelists and the others who were involved in this effort to be here today and share your thoughts with us. Let's give them a really warm round of applause. Thank you. Before everybody leaves, uh, I'd like to have Paige Everly come up and say her final pitch. And let me add that Paige worked very, very hard to put this panel together. I'm just the front person for it. Uh, and she's also responsible for the, uh, some of the enlargements that you can see of documents and newspaper stories related to this out in the hall on your way out. But let me turn it over to Paige. Just real quickly, at the conclusion of Alumni College, thank you for everyone who participated in Alumni College this year. Um, we will be sending out surveys, and I also will include um, links to uh, video as well as PowerPoints that were on some of the presentations so that you can look at those and use those at your leisure. Um, one quick thing, I do want to say that this is a fascinating story and it's amazing and I have been really drawn into it in the last two years that I have been with the college, um, but it isn't the only story. You all have amazing stories here and I want to give you two opportunities to tell us those stories. One is the Oral History Project, which takes place in ARH, um, the Alumni Recitation Hall, um, where the old um, cinema was. And if you would go in there, you can see signs that will direct you there. We would love for you to participate sometime this weekend in that. And also, Dana, are you here, Dana? Oh, she did. Okay. Um, if you see somebody around with video cameras, she's doing a documentary on Grinnell College and um, sort of a video um, heritage of it. And so she would love any of you to approach her if, with your stories. So thank you all for coming. And once okay. again, this was amazing. Thank you. There's a, there's a lunch at one, the liberal arts in prison.